are Baptist practices from the Bible or the Catholic Catechism. That's what this study is going to be about. This is going to be the second part of the, the first part there that I did, the Independent Fundamental Baptist Catholicism sermon. I made reference to the fact that many of the practices that are done by Baptists today, Independent Fundamental Baptists, they say that we are, you know, Bible-believing in all matters of faith and practice. Well, I'm going to show you today that that's not true. That uh, many of their practices actually come from here, not from here. And I know that that sounds controversial and some of you are all upset already, but uh, I'm going to prove it in this study. Um, and I just want to say this before we get into this thing. And that is, this whole series I'm doing here, talking about the Baptist system, this is not some kind of an attack on Baptists where I, all, I hate all the independent fundamental Baptists and I'm trying to, to, to destroy the IFB system. That isn't it at all. What I'm trying to get you to do is realize that many of the practices that you have do not come from the Bible. Does that make all the practices bad? No, not necessarily. It just means they're coming from tradition, the traditions of men, and not from the King James Bible. And that's very important for the future because, you see, when persecution comes, you're going to have to go back to this as your final standard. And many people, many of the IFB people, are going to have a very hard time abandoning the traditions that they have adopted as truth. That's the whole issue. That's the point of these studies. These studies are to make you think. That's what this thing is about. All right? But let's start out here quote from the article by Dr. Vernon C. Lyons that I referred to in the first IFBC uh, series. It says here, quote, Baptists are not Protestants, but hold tenaciously to the original precepts and practices of Christ and the, and the apostles. Baptists believe the pure word of God to be sufficient authority on all matters. Baptists reject all human religious traditions and practices that have originated since the time of the apostles. And there I have the link. Again, I'm going to have this PDF available. Um, you can follow along with it. And right there is the link to the website showing this article. Now he said there, Baptists are not Protestants but hold tenaciously to the original precepts and practices of Christ and the Apostles. That is an absolute lie. There are many things that are done in the modern day IFB church buildings that don't even go back 400 years, okay, as far as within Baptist circle, all right, and, and it's interesting because I've had people make this point before, and it's a good point, the disciples did not call themselves Christians in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says that they were called Christians, see, many times we as Christians label ourselves with the people, you know, make derogatory names or whatever for us, and label us as certain things. They were calling the first century believers, they were calling them Christians. And they, they adapted that, you know, okay, we are of Christ. And Baptists were not originally calling themselves Baptists. Okay, that was a title, the Anabaptists, the Rebaptizers. That was put on them by the Catholics and many of the Protestants. Because Protestants and Catholics teach baptismal regeneration. They teach that you baptize infants to get rid of the stain of original sin. See, that's what the whole thing was there. So this system of Baptists, uh, that name, uh, the believers in the past did not call themselves Baptists. All right, They believed in baptism by immersion of adults who are consenting to the fact of being born again and now they want to symbolize their death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus Christ. They are new creatures. That's the purpose of baptism. So, to say 400 years ago, the Baptists back then, not really accurate compared to the modern day use of the term Baptist. All right? Just want to make that point there. But to say that Christians, that Baptists, you know, people that baptize themselves, that they've always stuck by the original practices of Christ and the apostles, that's not true. And it goes on to say there that they reject all human religious traditions and practices that have originated since the time of the apostles. That's not true. But let's get into the study here I'm going to show you today. We're going to cover 10 points. 
things that are done in every independent fundamental Baptist church that I've ever been in, every single one of them, I've seen this same thing over and over and over and over again. And I realize there again, people say, you're just brush stroking, just, you know, attacking all IFB churches and acting like they're all the same. And they're not. Well, I'm aware of that. I'm aware that there are some things that they do differently. Some IFB church buildings pass an offering plate. Some don't. Some have a little box in the back. Some IFB church buildings are more into the thing of Sunday best, suits and ties. You know, I've been to some that the men are supposed to wear black suits with a white shirt and a black tie, and you wear a collared suit, and you're kind of like, ooh, you know. I mean, I've been to some real, real strict ones. I've been to ones that aren't as strict. I understand that there's a variation among the independent fundamental Baptists. But these 10 points right here, every IFB church building I've ever been to, they follow these 10 points. Okay, what are they? Number one, required Sunday worship. If you're not there Sunday morning and you do that thing for a few weeks, you get in trouble. You're supposed to be there, you know. Number two, wearing your Sunday best. Every IFB church building I've ever been into, they expect you to come in your Sunday best. Number three, the one-man pastor. I've never been in one IFB church building where they've had a plurality of elders. We're going to get into that as we continue. Number four, divine liturgy and repetitious services. Okay, within Catholicism, they have what they call divine liturgy, which is their order of service. And among the independent fundamental Baptists, they also have a repetitious service. They get into this, this thing and they just do the same thing every week. It's expected. Okay, and a lot of what goes on in Catholic divine liturgy is practiced among the independent fundamental Baptists, and there's no Reference to this stuff in Scripture. We're going to get into that as we continue. Stay tuned. Don't get offended yet. Number five. How about special music and choir? We'll see about that as we continue. Number six. Required tithing. Number seven. Altar calls. Number eight. Social events. Number nine. Excommunication and shunning. And number 10, integration of church and state slash military goals slash republicanism. Um, most conservative independent fundamental Baptists are die-hard Republicans. And the Democrats are the ones that are rotten and crooked. And when the Rep Republicans do something rotten and crooked, it's, well, you know, yeah, well, nobody's perfect. You know, but they don't get all up in arms about it. And by the way, before you get all excited and think that I'm a liberal Democrat, I'm not. I'm a registered Republican, okay? But I'm not so brainwashed that I can't see the corruption in my own party, all right? And by the way, I gave up the two-party system a long time ago because I realized the whole thing was a scam. Maybe on a small local level, there might be something there, a difference between Democrat and Republican. But at the highest levels, they're all owned by the corporations. They, you know, march to the tune of the dollar, you know, kind of deal. I mean, they're... They do what they're told for the, to the highest better, of course. So, but continuing here. And I have here, please note that not all of these things are sin, but they are all extra biblical. Okay? All of them. Now, I have here two links to two different websites. Uh, the first one there is the Catholic Catechism which is this one here. This is still the original. This is the one, the official Catholic Catechism for right now. This one I think was printed in 2001, but this is still, if you want to get the official sanctioned Catholic, Roman Catholic Catechism, this is the one right here. And I have the website right there in the PDF that you can go to that website and look up all the numbers to see that I'm not lying to you. The second one there, the other quotations, this will be the first one there, CC, and then the quote, this one here will be the BC, the Baltimore Catechism, okay? And I have the website for it there. So those are your two sources that I'm going to be using primarily for this study. And we're going to be getting into some other things here too. 
But let's get started here. Number one, required Sunday worship. All right. Let's read Catholic Catechism, number 1572. Its celebration calls for as many of the faithful as possible to take part. It should take place preferably on Sunday in the cathedral with solemnity appropriate to the occasion. Okay. Catholic Catechism, the second one here, is number 2041. It says the precepts, precepts of the church are set in the context of a moral life bound to and nourished by liturgical life. The obligatory character of these positive laws decreed by the pastoral authorities is meant to guarantee to the faithful the very necessary minimum in the spirit of prayer and moral effort and the growth of love, growth in love of God and neighbor. So they're saying if you really want to amount to anything as a Christian, then you have to be there. It's required. You are obliged to be there. Continuing. Baltimore Catechism. What sin does a Catholic commit who through his own fault misses Mass on a Sunday or Holy Day of, of obligation? A Catholic who through his own fault misses Mass on a Sunday or Holy Day of oblig obligation commits a mortal sin. Okay? Now see, that's what Catholicism teaches. But let's continue here. We'll see what the Bible actually teaches. Okay? Now here we have a Baptist, an independent fundamental Baptist church, <laughs> and this one was sent to me by a sister, um, a friend of the ministry, and it says here, this is Onawa Bible Baptist Church. These are IFB, okay? Don't tell me, oh, that's liberal or something like this. No, this is a Bible Baptist. Quote, finally make sure that you are here every time the church doors are open. The Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, oh brother. That means that fellowship in the word around God's people should be a number one priority in your life. Anything else that comes between that is idolatry and disobedience to God's revealed word. Oh boy. Your presence at the house of God is important to everyone, not just you. Oh boy. I have a couple problems with this. Okay, first of all, I did a whole sermon on the thing of Hebrews 10.25, which is the thing of not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, you know, or ourselves together. That has nothing to do with a Christian in the church age going to a church building. And it's kind of funny because they'll say to you, you know, you say I'm a house church Christian, they'll say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Well, I don't. I meet with Christians in my home. Yeah, but you're supposed to be in the house of God. The guy says it. You know, I showed you the web page there. He says it in their little thing there on their church website. The house of God is not a stinking building that's patterned after Greek paganism with a phallus on top. Watch the first study if you don't know what I'm talking about. That's not the house of God. All right? You're not going to build a building and have that thing be God's special habitation. This right here, where I'm at right here, is just as much a house of God as some building someplace. Probably more so because this is what God created. God didn't create the building there. You know, so just absurd. Absolutely absurd. But see, this is what they do. And I've been to the IFB church buildings, and boy, everything's fine. And you are in the in crowd as long as you're there every time the doors are open. But, oh, brother, you miss one service, or maybe two, oh, boy, you know, two, and three, oh, man. And you're just like, I saw you weren't here last week, you know. I remember the one time uh, I was going to this IFB, you know, church, and um, I got, like, really, really, really sick, had the flu. I mean, I was in real bad shape, and uh, I, I didn't come, and... Or I came on the Sunday morning and I was supposed to read the Bible, you know, which we'll get into that later about that whole thing. And I was supposed to read the Bible and I stood up and I was just like, Ugh, you know, I was feeling bad. And so I was like, I'm not coming tonight. You know, and they were like, well, you were supposed to do such and such. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sick. I can't come. And instead I was like, you know, my niece had her second, you know, two. she was turning two years old. And I went to the party, and I didn't even join in the party. I was sitting out in the living room, just sitting there, just sick. Just I was in bad shape. And the senior pastor of that phallus house there, 
he said to another brother that I knew, he said, Brian's not faithful to the church because I missed a service when I was sick. I mean, I was there all the time. I was fixing things and doing things and building things and doing all kinds of stuff involved in the ministry. But I missed a service, so I wasn't faithful to God's house. And that's the way a lot of the, not all the IFB systems, I know somebody's out there screaming right now, we don't do that, you know, and stuff. But a lot of them do. A lot of them do. A lot of them have that exact philosophy right there, just like the Ottawa Bible Baptist Church. A lot of them have that philosophy. If you're not there every time the doors are open and you're not coming to the house of God, that's idolatry. You're in sin. Yeah, horse feathers. Now let's look at the Catholic Catechism, number 2178. Now remember what the guy said there, quoting Hebrews 10, 25? Here you have the Catholic Catechism. Quote, This practice of the Christian assembly dates from the beginnings of the apostolic age. The letter to the Hebrews reminds the faithful, quote, not to neglect to meet together. Huh. As is the habit of some, but to encourage one another. Tradition preserves the memory of an every timely Ever timely exhortation, come to church early, approach the Lord, and confess your sins, repent in prayer, be present at the sacred and divine liturgy, conclude its prayer, and do not leave beyond before the dismissal. We have often said, this day is given to you for prayer and rest. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the Catholic Catechism. You mean the Catholic Catechism would use the same stupid argument as a Bible Baptist church? No, must just be my imagination, right? Maybe I read that thing wrong, right? Sure. <coughs> Keep telling yourself that. Catholic Catechism number 1181. A church, a house of prayer in which the Eucharist is celebrated and reserved, where the faithful assemble and where is worshipped the presence of the Son of God our Savior, offered for us on the sacrificial altar for the help and consolation of the faithful. This house ought to be in good taste and a worthy place for prayer and sacred ceremonial in this house of God. Where did I hear that before? The truth and the harmony of the signs that make it up should show Christ to be present and active in this place. Sounds just like an IFB church. They say the same thing. It's good to be in the house of God this morning, amen? Amen, amen. Preach it, brother. <laughs> oh, uh, the Baptists are Bible believers in all matters of faith and practice. No, you're not. No, you are not. The building that you're meeting in there is not the house of God. There is no house of God on this earth. All right? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right there. Not some building. Isn't it interesting that the independent Baptists are saying the same things that appear in the Catechism? It's a problem. Catholic Catechism number 2176. Quote, The celebration of Sunday observes the moral commandment inscribed by nature in the human heart to render to God an outward, visible, public, and re regular worship as a sign of His universal Beneficence to all. Sunday worship fulfills the moral command of the Old Covenant, taking up its rhythm and spirit in the weekly celebration of the Creator and Redeemer of His people. You say, well now, Brian, you know, it's strongly recommended or strongly suggested, you know, um, that we are there on every time the doors are open, but it's not a command, right? I mean, you're not going to get in trouble for not coming occasionally. Let me read you the... Uh, statement of beliefs here of another independent fundamental King James Bible believing militant old time religion Baptist church the one I used to go to countrychapelbaptistchurch.com about the about us page article 7 membership 1c section 1c quote all members are expected first of all to be faithful in all spiritual duties essential to a successful Christian life i.e. prayer, Bible, reading, witnessing, etc. Second, to regularly attend the services of the church, to regularly give to its support and to its charities as the Lord hath prospered, and to share in its organized work when possible. 2C, members failing to attend and or support the church without a legitimate excuse 
may be dropped from the membership within a period of three months at the discretion of the vicar. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Pastor. You know. Section 2D. No member of this church may hold membership in any other church. If any member unites in membership with another church, that person is automatically terminated without notice from membership in this church. Hmm. Unites in membership with another church? What if they're saved? What if you have another church of saved people? Well then, brother, you better not unite in membership with them. Um... Do you see the problem that makes? You see, the Bible, the King James Bible, teaches that the church is Christ's body. One body. Regardless of what some of you think out there. Okay? There's one body. Many members of that one body, but one body. There are not 50 Christs up there in heaven. You have the Baptist Christ, and you have the Presbyterian Christ, and you have the Methodist Christ, and you have the Brethren Christ, and you have the Bible, Independent Bible Christ. What is this? There's one body, okay, composed of many members. So if you have Independent Fundamental Baptists, and they go and they actually find a Methodist, I was actually in an, a uh, Methodist uh, church building the one time, and they were King James Bible believing there. I couldn't believe it. You know, and it was an old time guy, you know, and he was preaching the word. I mean, talked to him a little bit afterwards. I mean, it was, it, the, the guys were good, solid Bible believers. Shouldn't have been in a, in a phallus house there, a Greek phallus house. But the point is, they were saved. And if I would have been in the area there, you know, and newly saved or whatever, if I, you know, years ago when I was still going to the buildings, you know, I'd have gone to a place like that. Well, then according to this here, I would have been joining myself to another member or um, a member of another church. No, actually, I would have been going to a, another group of believers. All right, why? Because there's one body, one church, living group of believers. Unless you're this hardcore independent fundamental Baptist and you better not talk to anybody else. You say, where does this philosophy come from? It in the Bible. Baltimore Catechism number 206. Why does a Catholic sin against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship? A Catholic sins against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship when he attends, intends to identify himself with a religion he knows is defective. Hmm. You say, now brother, the uh, independent fundamental Baptists wouldn't say that, would they? Uh, yes, they would. There's a church in Denver here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, a little town named Denver. It's called Mount Zion Baptist Church. The pastor's name there is Pastor Keith Schweitzer. I attended there for probably about a year. I met with him in his home the one time, and he told me face to face that he would not have Kent Hoven, Dr. Kent Hoven, he said, I will not have that man in my church, you know, his building there, he said, he will not come to my church because he has spoken to non-Baptists. Where does this teaching come from? Right there. I just read it to you. It's on the PDF. Look it up. It doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from here. All right? I mean, when do you see that thing in the Bible? You know... Well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. There was a guy that did that in the Bible, you know, that wouldn't allow certain brethren to come in because he was lording over the flock there. But it's condemned. Something else. Catholic Catechism. Quote, The parish initiates the Christian people into the ordinary expression of the liturgical life. It gathers them together in this celebration. It teaches Christ's saving doctrine. It practices the charity of the Lord in good works and brotherly love. Now listen to this. Quote, You cannot pray at home as at church, where there is a great multitude, where exclamations are, are cried out to God as far as from one great heart, and where there is something more, the union of minds, the accord of souls, the bond of charity, the prayer, prayers of the priests. 
Oh boy, isn't that something? Here we have a fundamentalistbaptistchurch.org, what we believe, that section there. Again, I have the link. <coughs> Quote, the church. We believe that the institution of the local church was set up by Jesus. Attendance and membership in a local New Testament church is God's plan for the believer and is not to be forsaken. The church is to be led by a pastor who, who is to shepherd the people as God's appointed leader, yet without committing the sin of lording it over the flock. And they do all the time, by the way. We'll be getting into that as we continue. But see how the Baptists, independent fundamental Baptists, and Catholics in these areas are saying the same things? The Catholic Catechism. You cannot pray at home as at church. You know? And I've had that thing put on me numerous times, you know? Oh, you have a house church. Oh, when are you going to get a real church? Meaning, when am I going to go to a building someplace? They do it. And uh, the thing there, where there is a great multitude... Now, if you look at the IFBC studies, the first part there, what about the church buildings? Look at some of the comments, some of the people that were against the video, and watch what they say. They'll say, how are you going to fit a thousand people into your living room? Huh? They didn't even realize what they were saying, but they're speaking according to the catechism, not according to the Bible. Isn't that something? How are you going to fit a thousand people in? Um, okay, here's another question for you. Can you show me a independent fundamental Baptist church that has a thousand members that are worth anything for the Lord? I've been to bigger churches. I know how it is. You boil down that faithful, the faithful ones that are actually doing the work there, it's a small handful. You know? I know Brother James Melton, which he's very much, he's 501c3 and he's got a church building and all that other stuff. He screwed up in that area. But I remember he made a, he did a message at one time called Brother Melton's weight loss plan for the big fat church, you know? And in that message, he went on to talk about, well, you preach against rock music and you preach against immodest apparel and you preach against television and you preach against the new versions and you preach against, you know, all these different things. You'll cut down the size of that thousand member church to just a real small little one. And you'll see that thing. And you say, but brother, I know a good one and there's a thousand people that go there. All right. But then your standard's not really here, is it? I mean, show me where they had a church building and there were a thousand people in regular attendance. They were running a thousand people in, in, in Sunday school and going out and picking them up in chariots or something. I mean, where's this stuff at? You see, it's a human religious tradition that appeared since the time of the completion of Scripture. Again, prove me wrong. Show me these things in the Bible. And see, if you are holding on to these traditions with this death grip, and you're saying, I won't let it go, I won't let it go, I won't let it go, I won't, you're going to be forced to eventually. And again, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but the sodomite agenda is moving at breakneck speed, and it's moving to come in and persecute church buildings. And that's going to happen. And you say, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. No, you won't. If you don't have the guts to start a house church now, when it won't cost you anything, you're not going to do it in the future when it becomes illegal. You're going to compromise. You're going to say, well, you know, we, our lawyer talked to the guy from FEMA or whatever, you know, and, and uh, they said that as long as we preach this and that, then we can still keep our doors open. So we're still going to do it. And that's what you're going to do. Yeah, you will. But what about the Bible? What does the Bible say? This thing of required worship on a Sunday. Is that there? Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Because a lot of people are probably going, yeah, it's the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. You know, they met on the Sabbath day. No, they didn't. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. What was the first day of the week in the Bible? Sunday. Did they meet on Sundays? Yes. Does the Bible say that they met every Sunday from 9 to 12 in the morning? No. The Bible does not say that. The Bible does not say that it was a required weekly meeting. I'll show you another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
okay? So they're gathering these people, the money that they were able to give to the poor saints in Jerusalem, they're gathering it on the first day of the week. Does that necessarily say that that was when they had it every week? No. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say you are required to be there, you are required to give 10%. It doesn't say that. But we'll get more into that later as we continue as well. The early Christians did meet on Sundays, but was it a required weekly meeting? So I've written there. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. But I'm sure Paul was going and in attendance at a local independent Baptist church. You know, fundamental. Sorry, I forgot that. Yeah, I'm sure he was there every Sunday, every time the doors were open. Yeah. Galatians 1, verse 18 and 19 says, Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, but other the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. So I guess Paul wasn't a very good church member. If Paul had been a member of Country Chapel Catholic church, uh, Baptist Church, um, where I used to go, uh, it said, you know, three months... If you're not in regular attendance for three months, you're automatically kicked out. And Paul, being a Jew, went to the Gentiles. And the brethren in Jerusalem are going, hey, what are you doing? What's this all about? You know? And he had to go and he had to talk to them. You read about that, you know? Well, I guess then he would have been going to the Gentile church instead of the Jewish church, you know, independent fundamental uh, Baptist Jewish church instead of the, you know, I mean, see how ridiculous it gets after a while? But let me ask you a question. Let me just throw something else at you. If you're one of these IFB traditionalists, what do people do in countries like Pakistan? Where if you're caught being a Christian, you're executed? Do they have to be part of a local New Testament independent fundamental Baptist church and be there every time the doors are open? Or they're out of fellowship with the Lord? Hmm? What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the Christians back there during the Dark Ages that had to meet in secret, had to meet in the fields, in the forests, in caves? What are you going to do about that? Were they there every time the doors were open? You see, this whole system of the independent fundamental Baptist system, it only is a few hundred years old. The very first independent, you know, IFB church building was built in 1700. So it'd be 313 years old. It's not a very old movement, is it? Hmm. And I see, you see, what I, what I believe happened here in a very subtle, very sly way, a lot of these early Baptists that didn't want anything at all to do with these Greek Parthenons with a phallus on top, you know, church buildings, and they would rather go to jail than go into one. Watch the first study. I give you the quotes, you know, from some of the heroes of the Baptist faith, you know. It's kind of funny. But what was going on, those guys back then, you know, they didn't want anything to do with that. And, you know, this tradition has passed to us today. And how did you get, you know, you say, well, how did we get from back then the way it was to the way it is now? Well, if I was to guess, and I can't document this, I don't really know when these practices started to seep in, the thing of, you know, Bible-believing people that were baptizing adults, you know. When did they start to bring in some of these practices of Catholicism? Well, I would say probably when a lot of the Catholics, you know, they probably were converting Catholics, and the Catholics were coming along saying, I'm saved now, but boy, it sure would be nice if we had a church building to worship in, because I miss that old cathedral. Boy, it sure would be nice if we had the required Sunday worship. Boy, it sure would be nice if we had the and on and on and on and on and on. And I'm going to tell you right now, too, that's a big temptation when you leave the institutional church and you go and you try to start a house church. You're very tempted to, to make your house church appear just like it was there from your independent fundamental Baptist church system. You can't do that. Back to the Bible. That's the way you do it. You know, you know, go by the scriptures. 
that should be your standard. All right? But a lot of these Baptist churches, that's not the standard. Well, let's continue on here. Number two, what about wearing your Sunday best? Um, could you show me anywhere in the scriptures where this was done? You know, for those of you out there that are all riled up right now, could you please show me where this thing happened? You say, oh, then it's a great sin and a great evil that will send people to hell. I didn't say that. I didn't say putting a suit and tie on as a man and putting a real nice dress on as a woman is a horrible, wicked sin that makes you an apostate. I didn't say that. What I said is, when the independent fundamental Baptists are putting down other believers and saying, we are the ones that hold to the Bible alone in all matters of faith and practice. What I'm saying is, you're a liar. That's not true. That is not true. And this thing of Sunday best, I'll give you, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I think in many cases, it's good for a new convert. You say, well, then it's good. I didn't say that. I said it, it might be good for a new convert, but it's not scriptural. It is not found in the Bible. So don't act like it is. That's the whole issue here. <clears throat> now, I couldn't find anything in the catechism specifically on the subject of Sunday best. But here's a woman that actually writes for the Catholic Church, catholicstand.com, and I have the link to the article right here. She says, quote, Still, even with the chaos, I feel it is so important that we always wear our Sunday best to Mass that I am willing to ensure, endure the insanity that comes with getting so many people ready. She has like eight or ten kids or something. That's what she's talking about. You might be asking yourself why I go to the trouble of getting everyone in their best clothes if it takes so much effort. You might be wondering why we just don't go in jeans or whatever clothes we have on hand. The reason is simple. Now here, think about if you've been to an IFB church Think about what they'll say. They call that building the house of God. Keep that in mind. Quote, We dress our best for Mass because we know that we are going to be in Christ's presence. We are going to witness the moment that heaven meets earth. And we are going to the greatest feast we can ever go to. How can we not dress our best to meet Christ in the Holy Eucharist? You know, it should be you know, greet, meet, and eat Christ. Because <laughs> you know? that's what the Holy Eucharist is. You know, the priest stands up there and says, Oscar Maya Salami, Hasta la Santaya, bow tie, Like that. And this cookie becomes Jesus Christ. And then he says, eat him. You know, and drink his blood. You know, be a vampire. You know, <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. It's cannibalism. You know, and if you, and if you say, no, Brian, now come on. It's just, it's just wine and a communion wafer. Um, tell your priest that. Say that you don't actually believe it's the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. Tell him that. See what his answer is. But uh, continuing here, she says, quote, If you currently don't dress in your Sunday best to meet the Lord at Mass, I challenge you to dress up for a month of Sundays instead of just grabbing whatever you can uh, put thought into what you would wear if you were to meet the Pope a job interviewer, the queen, and then think about what you are planning to wear when you meet the king of kings. Uh, I hate to tell you to the Catholics out there, you're not meeting the king of kings when you're eating a cookie. Okay? Sorry. And to you independent fundamental Baptists out there, you're not meeting Jesus Christ by going to a building. If you don't know that, I feel real bad for you. You can meet Jesus Christ anywhere. All right? But what about what does the Bible actually say about this thing of dressing up? James chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool, are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? And again, you know, I'm sure that there are independent fundamental Baptists out there that are more respectful of people that come in in vile raiment. But a lot of them I've been to, they will give the preferred place 
to somebody who comes in in the gay clothing, goodly apparel, in other words. The man with the gold ring, you know, especially a lot of times, a lot of the independent fundamental Baptists, the, the, that man with the gold ring on, you know, is a mason. Because the Baptist churches are filled with masons many, many, many times. Especially like the Southern Baptists, you know. <clears throat> and again, you know, get upset, you know, kick the crib, you know, suck your thumb, you just get your pacifier, put it back in, all right? You know, I, I, you know, people get, oh, I'm so mad because you're, you know, you're so sarcastic and Brian, I get kicked all the time. You know, it, it, it's funny, people don't get upset when I'm getting kicked, but when I kick back, they get upset, you know? And I've been called retarded, I've been called an idiot, I've been called all kinds of names by independent fundamental Baptists because of my stands that I take. Hey, if you are man enough to kick me, then by God, I'm man enough to kick you back. Luke chapter 20, verses 45 through 47. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. Hmm. Now, you know, of course, Catholicism is one of the modern-day fulfillments of that verse. They like to walk in long robes, you know, with the processions and stuff, and here comes the Pope dressed like a dope, you know, and, you know, all that. Now, I'll tell you, I've never been in an independent, yeah, independent, independent fundamental Baptist church uh, where the pastor comes out dressed in a long robe. I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> but then again, I haven't been in all of them. You know, there could be one out there. But uh, a lot of these men are worshipped, which we're going to get into as we continue here. But why are so many of these independent fundamental Baptists so concerned about the outward appearance? And they are. You know, they'll, they'll get all upset and all worked up, you know, and and, uh, you know, a woman comes and she's not dressed real nice, you know, and stuff. And they'll, they'll kind of put her down and things until she starts to dress, you know, real modestly and everything in a nice dress. And, you know, I believe a woman should dress modestly. I, I believe in modest apparel. I have a sermon on it, you know. But, you know, some of these guys just go overboard with it. And, you know, I mean, I've had independent fundamental Baptists, you know, that, that uh, get mad at me because I have a beard. You know, when I'm out, I remember one, this guy, you know, he wouldn't even wear jeans when he was working. Like, okay, you know. So Sunday best can even go into, you know, during the week. But let me ask you a question. What if the man who's dressed up real nice is rotten on the inside, but looks good on the outside? Oh, there wouldn't be any of that in the independent fundamental Baptist churches, would there? Uh huh. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27 and 28 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear out beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outward, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And, you know, again, I know, I know, all independent fundamental Baptists are not the same. I know that. It's not some denomination that produces all a bunch of clones. I know that. There's a lot of variety within them. I know that. But I also know that there are some independent fundamental Baptists that are just as rotten and as hypocritical as they could be. I know that too. See? But they look nice on the outside. Got a nice suit and tie on. Really just to please, you know. And they preach good sermons, you know, and everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course you have, it's very, very true for Catholic priests as well, because, you know, you got some Catholic priest up there and he's walking up, you know, walking up there and he's, you know, doing his little ceremony up there and all this stuff like that. And the guy was a, is a child molester. You know, he's a whited sepulcher. That's all he is. <laughs> 